our day chair today is Sydney Skemp. Sydney is a new member to our club. Speaking of new members, she recently moved to Minneapolis after graduating from Drake University. No other Drake University folks in the room? <laughs> we'll start a, start a group, right? When the next one comes, right? <laughs> uh, Sydney currently works at Metter, Meter, Meter, M-E-T-R-E, one of those creative spellings, an advertising agency in the North Loop, She's an account coordinator on the account management team. Originally from La Crosse, Sydney is very close to her family, which consists of her two parents, Michelle and Joe, who are Rotarians themselves. So that's actually why Sydney came here, because she knew about how cool Rotary is. Um, she has three older sisters and three nephews. She loves spending quality time with family and friends, finding new coffee shops, or hiking trails and boating on the Mississippi at her family cottage in Tropolo, Wisconsin. Sydney is a trained musician. Yes, hopefully we'll be hearing more from you and loves to sing and dance. She's always looking for recommendations as she's new to the city. So don't hesitate to reach out and get to know Sydney. Take it away, Sydney. How fun. Okay. Thank you, Jean. Well, as she said, I have the privilege of being today's day chair. So I am going to introduce you to our guest, Jazz Hampton, who is the CEO and general counsel at Turn Signal and an adjunct professor at the University of St. Thomas Opus College of Business. Hampton has been featured on NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt, MSNBC, CBS, NBC Top Story, and was recently named one of Minneapolis St. Paul's 40 Under 40 for his work at Turn Signal and in the community, where he sits on the board of directors at the Minneapolis Foundation, Catholic Charities Twin Cities, and Great North Innocence Project. He is also a Masonic Institute for the Developing Brains Phila Phila Philanthropy. I always have issues with this word, and I always have to read it. Philanth philanthropic. Okay. Philanthropic Advisory Council member. Sorry. Before joining Turn Signal, Hampton was the Director of Diversity and Inclusion and a practicing attorney at Foley and Mansfield, a national law firm with 150 plus attorneys, as well as an adjunct professor at Mitchell Hamlin School of Law. Please join me in welcoming Jazz. Uh, I joined that that council that you just named, and one of the first things I said when I joined was, can we work on the name? Uh, the Masonic Institute for the Developing Brains Philanthropic Advisory Council is a lot. Uh, it's an honor to to be here today and, and to see all of the exciting things that you all are doing. So first and foremost, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for what you all do as a, as a club and as an organization. It means so much to the community that I love and hold dear to my heart. I'm born and raised right here in the Twin Cities, uh, in the best city in the Twin Cities, that is Richfield, Minnesota. Uh, no hard feelings to anyone else, especially you dying of friends. Uh, uh, so I was I was born and raised here in the in the Twin Cities, and uh, I've never left. I went to the University of St. Thomas for undergrad uh, and for law school, um, but I had a very normal career, which I'll dive into here in a moment, uh, and it all changed in, in 2020. Uh, so I'm going to tell a little bit of that founder story today. I'm also, no one likes to listen to people talk, and lawyers love to talk, so I'm going to try to be cognizant of that today. And I'm going to try to leave time at the end for some questions, if you do have any, because I think that's always the most important thing when I kind of tell this founder story from here in the Twin Cities. Uh, so that's the overview. I'm going to say who I am, talk a little bit about Turn Signal and what we do, and what we see as keys to success, and of course, those questions and answers. Uh, so what what do we do? I always start by saying, could you please, and, and my feelings won't be hurt, don't worry, raise your hand if you do know what turn signal is. Almost every room that I'm in now, it's about 50-50, and I love that, actually. And, and, and I fi find it as an opportunity to really educate people on the work that we do. Um, so, so what do we do? 
uh, as I mentioned, I was born and raised here in the Twin Cities. And, and unfortunately, where we used to be known primarily for things like Prince or Kirby Puckett or Kevin Garnett or, or the Minnesota Vikings not winning too much, uh, that that was the, the what or the Mall of America. That's what people think of when they think of Minnesota. And unfortunately, it started to change in 2020, actually in 2016, with the with the tragic loss of folks like Philando Castile and George Floyd and subsequently Dante Wright. Uh, and and I was here in the Twin Cities, and I was working as a lawyer, and I was I was representing large companies, Fortune 500 companies, when they were being sued. Um, and one day I got a call from from my two friends from college. Uh, one went to the University of St. Thomas. One went to Gus Davis. So good to see another Gusty here. Yeah. Um, and and we actually met playing football. That's a lie. We were on the bench. We. We met on the bench uh, at the University of St. Thomas on the football team, uh, and, and they called me after after George Floyd. And I just if you take yourself back to that summer and, and what it was like, this was covid. This was when we were using Clorox wipes to wipe down groceries that we bring into our house. Uh, everyone's staring at their phones all the time, uh, maybe having happy hour a little earlier than we normally would uh, on a day to day basis. And then and then the video of George Floyd is released and the whole world changes. It starts in Minneapolis, of course, reverberates to the larger community keeps going to the to the country and to the world we see protests all across the country and i was asked to be on so many panels during that time so many guest speaking opportunities about what we can do how we can bridge this gap um and then my two friends andre and mike called me and they said jazz we're sick of just going to to marches and talking about solutions and we we want to try to build one and we want to build a solution that can make everyone feel safe in these interactions everyone from the drivers that maybe feel unsafe during these pullovers or maybe even when they're in an accident all the way to the law enforcement officers like my brother who graduated from alexandria tech's law enforcement program right here in the state of minnesota how do we bridge that gap to make these interactions safer and how can we do that in a meaningful way and in a scalable way uh, so we decided to all quit our jobs three years ago to the date, November 1st, I left my law firm to start Turn Signal. And so right by now, you're probably thinking, what is this solution? What do you do? Um, Turn Signal uh, is a mobile platform that connects drivers to an attorney with one press of a button or with a voice command on their cell phone instantaneously. So if you're pulled over, you take your phone out and you press one button and instantly there's an attorney on the screen on a video call, just like we're on a video call right now. Uh, to guide you through that interaction and fulfill our mission. And our mission is really simple and it's three-pronged. It's to protect driver's rights. It's to de-escalate these roadside interactions. And third, and then most importantly, it's to ensure that every driver and law enforcement officer feels safer about this interaction that they're having that day. Uh, and that starts with the bumper stickers that we provide anyone that wants to put on their car as well. So when the law enforcement officer pulls over that car and they see that bumper sticker, the first thing we want them to think, and we work actively with them to, to educate them, is to think, oh, this is actually going to be the safest interaction I have today. Uh, we started this platform by interviewing over 25 law enforcement officers right here in the state of Minnesota. I'm giving another presentation this afternoon with one of those officers, actually. And what we tried to do is say, how can we d disseminate the message that this is going to be a really safe and great interaction for you as well? We started right here in the state of Minnesota, uh, and we started expanding slowly. Uh, we went to eight states, and we were eight states for about a year and a half. And I'm really proud to say, as of this summer in September, Turn Signal is now nationwide in all 50 states plus the DC. And, and that was our journey. That was our story of, of where we started and, and where we went to. Uh, we launched it initially as a, as a consumer app. And what I think is most important about Turn Signal is uh, Turn Signal is a subscription based model, right? So if you want Turn Signal on your phone when you leave today, uh, whether you are, are concerned about yourself or someone else, uh, it's $60 a year, no matter if you use it 100 times or you never have to use it. However, uh, if you are low income, if you make under $40,000, it is completely free to you. We never charge you a penny. In fact, we won't even take your credit card information when you become a member of the platform. We won't do it. Uh, we don't want anyone choosing between having themselves feeling safe when they're driving on the road and and or having their loved one or having an ability to pay for the service. And we were able to do that with wonderful partners like Blue Cross Blue Shield of Minnesota, the Minnesota Vikings, uh, Caribou Coffee, and so many others that are helping us subsidize those memberships for people who really need it more than anyone else. Uh, and so that's really important to our mission. And when we started that, that consumer platform, that is exactly how we started it, uh, available to those folks. Fast forward a little bit, and we started talking about what we can look like to, to get this in a really scalable, meaningful way. 
Uh, and I'm really proud to say what we launched uh, in, as you can see here on the timeline in October of 2021, was it was a B2B option. And so what does that look like? Uh, Turn Signal now is available as an employee benefit to organizations that want to step up and say, hey, we really want to tell our employees that we don't think of you as just someone who's coming to do work day in and day out. We think of you as someone who uh, is a holistic person, a person that has family, loved ones that is driving to and from work. And we want to ensure that you have that peace of mind 24-7 when you're on the road as well. And so companies like uh, Lurie or, or, or Baker Tilly, uh, uh, iHeartRadio, and, and so many others in the Twin Cities and beyond, to, uh, um, uh, YWCA, about 35 organizations, I think there's a slide on it coming up, provide turn signals of benefit to their employees to say, hey, we want to know that we care about you during that commute as well. Uh, and so that's what we launched in October of 2021, which was a really great success. Um, and, and just so you can kind of visualize what, what I've been talking about, as you can see on the screen here, there's two buttons. There's a larger yellow one and, and words right below it. Uh, and so you can press either button on the platform. You either say, I'm being pulled over or I've been in an accident. It's about 70-30, the ratio of, of pullovers to accidents, 30% being accidents that, that our platform receives. Uh, and as of today, we are receiving well over 200 calls a month which is a, a few calls uh, day in and day out across the country, seeing people really needing the service in that real time. And so when you press that button, it instantly connects you to an attorney. You can follow their guidance uh, during that interaction. What's really crucial is those first three to eight minutes before the officer actually gets to the window. I don't know if you think about it. It's like uh, if you when you buy a new car, uh, and uh, I right now I drive a 2016 Tahoe. It's not new. Uh, but when I drive my Tahoe, I see Tahoes all the time, right? When you have a new car, you see those cars on the road. I can't tell you how often I see cars being pulled over now. And the and I encourage you to think about this the next time you see one. I guarantee you the next time you see a car pulled over, the police officer will still be back in their car and the driver will be in their car. And it is just two individuals sitting in their vehicles. That is the vast majority of what happens during traffic stops. It's in their own separate vehicles. And that's the time when the attorney is really on the, on the phone with the driver, really going through what their concern would be, what maybe their fear is. Uh, all of the attorneys on our platform have to go through a third-party de-escalation training that was created by an organization called Crisis Prevention Institute. And that de-escalation training helps them in those moments when they can really talk to that driver and help them understand how they can make this interaction safer during that moment. Um, and, and I really value that because I've spent time when I was in law school as a public defender. Um, and, and half of my work was sitting down with that individual that I was with and saying, hey, when we get out there, the judge is going to read the complaint. They're going to say that you did X, Y, and Z after you left the Twins game and maybe threw a fire extinguisher through a, a window on, on Washington Avenue. Uh, what I need you not to do is not to roll your eyes or not to throw your arms up in frustration. It's not going to help our cause. And we can really go through this interaction in a really calm way, and it'll have better results for everyone involved. It's the same kind of messaging that these attorneys are able to give to these drivers. Uh, Flando Castile was pulled over 49 times in 13 years. Uh, you could imagine that someone in that position might be a little frustrated. Uh, he didn't show it in the video, but but uh, you can imagine that maybe someone's uh, blood pressure is elevated. Maybe they're giving nonverbal cues of, of frustration. And that's what the attorney can be there to help guide you through uh, in that moment of need as well. At the end of the call, there's really three simple questions that are asked. Uh, would you like to hang up right now? Because we never want to have an accidental hang up. Uh, would you like to talk to an attorney further about the situation? And the third and final is, would you like to talk to this attorney that you dealt with today? Uh, if they say yes, we then automatically exchange the information between the attorney and the driver. And if not, that attorney never has uh, that driver's contact information and does not contact them. And most importantly, this entire interaction is recorded with the front-facing camera of that driver's phone. Uh, for for us who were born in the in the picture-in-picture -picture era, that's what the video looks like at the end of it. It's a picture-in-picture -picture of both the audio of what the the camera was seeing and what the attorney was saying to you. And most importantly, that video is only available to the driver. We at Turn Signal cannot even see that video, uh, and we give the driver the autonomy to do with and, and what they want with that video, and really encourage them to to save it for their own uh, documents and, and records, so they can download that video and have it available to them at all times. Um, when we talk about our our stakeholders, I always we from day one, I think when we were brainstorming in the summer of 2020, we came up with with the four P's. Uh, and it was really important to us because we are, we're trying to understand who are the people that we're going to use turn signal. Uh, and we were wildly correct. And, and I thought of them from my own perspective, right? Uh, I thought of, of myself as a parent. I have three kids. Uh, I don't know if you can tell by how much coffee I've ingested this morning. Uh, but my kids are, are four, 
are six, four, and two. My wife is out of town for the week, so it's a miracle that I'm here this morning. Uh, my my kids are are six, four, and two, but I can guarantee you when they're driving, I'm going to need them to have turn signal on their phone. Uh, my my co-founder Mike talks about the story of when he when he first got his driver's license, he got in an accident, and he was too scared to tell his mom, and so he didn't. And he tried to get through it on his own. And then when he got home, his mom said, you got in an accident. Why didn't you tell me? And he was like, I was nervous and, and I didn't want to, to scare you. I'm, I'm fine. And she's like, okay, well, did you get pictures of the the, the scene? No. D did you get pictures of their driver's license or their insurance? They said it was okay and I didn't really need to. Did you collect any cell phone information from them? I, I, di I didn't think it was necessary. Um, that is the, the other moment that we're trying to cure in this for, for those parents uh, to be there uh, with your child whenever you can, uh, even if you are available and they are, if you, they do call, maybe you're not available because you're at work. Parents are a really key uh, demographic within our user base. Uh, the second is, is people worried about their partners. Uh, my wife is, let's see if this one gets a cheer. My wife is from a town called Bell Plain, Minnesota. No one from Bell Plain. Good. It's Minneapolis Rotary. I don't spend much time down there either. Uh, yeah. I try not to, at least. Uh, no, my my wife is from Belle Plain, Minnesota, and and when she's driving from her parents' house, who still live there, forty five minutes up to our house at 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 midnight after dropping off the kids or after going to check in on 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 the grandkids at, at grandma and grandpa's, I'm worried about her driving by herself on on one sixty nine when it goes through Jordan by the candy store. I don't want her to be alone if she's uh, in an accident on a one lane highway with no with no uh, stop or stop light or or road light in 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 the area so it's another opportunity to be there for her in that moment of need uh people of color it's simple uh people of color are disproportionately stopped by law enforcement they are disproportionately searched uh the the contraband that is found in those searches is lower than the contra contraband found of the searches of their non non uh people of color counterparts uh and this is an availability for them to have peace of mind in that moment as well but the last one that I think people don't think of naturally are police officers as well, right? Um, if if we are are having an interaction that is safer and makes the driver feel safer and they can communicate that well to the officer, they too can feel safer. Um, the de-escalation on both sides can really make everyone feel safer and have better outcomes in that moment as well. Uh, and so the police are the other stakeholder that we're really trying to address in this moment. These are just some of the organizations that we've partnered with from, from Ford. We have a partnership with Ford right now. We're really working on integrating into vehicles at this time. So really exciting updates coming on that in Q1 of next year. Um, and we have over 100,000 downloads and, and 20, 25,000 plus active users. That means someone who can take out their phone and press that button in a moment's notice. Uh, and then covered lives. That's the non amount of organizations that are the people that are covered through their organizations that have turn signal on their phone as well. Um, I'll skip this slide and I'll say this, uh, looking ahead, I, I always say turn signals mission, uh, is to protect rights, deescalate and get everyone home safely. Our vision is to connect people to the professional services they need in real time. Right? So if you think about that beyond just the, the law enforcement pullover situation, if you think about that for mental health crises, if you think about this for addiction services, if you think about this for, uh, domestic violence, there's so many opportunities to, to expand turn signal, uh, beyond our current model. And that's our vision for turn signal know as we look ahead um i i really i have to say this you know as as a founder that's based here in in minneapolis i live in south minneapolis uh not quite edina don't worry uh i live in south minneapolis and 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 when i come here and i'm talking to the rotary club what struck me uh as i was preparing for this was and and i stand behind because i want the camera to see the four-way test truth fair goodwill and friendship and is it beneficial? I feel like that could have been Turn Signal's mission statement. And that's why I'm so proud to be here in this room today. Uh, we're seeking truth with with the the light that we're shining on these interactions. And at the end of it, on that fourth one, we know that it's beneficial not only to the driver but to all parties involved in this interaction. Uh, we always say if we're struggling to legislate, then we have to innovate, uh, and that's what we look to do at Turn Signal. We wanted to innovate around this uh, current need that we had and and bring a real solution uh, to bear. So uh, I'm I'm honored to be here and to speak to you all, especially with with those four things in mind. And I would love to, to field any questions that you may have about turn signal or the entrepreneurial journey. Yeah. Do we need the microphone? I don't want to get in trouble. I want to be in. Yeah, I want to be invited back. First and foremost, thank you. Uh, it's yeah. obvious that you're amazing. So I thank you for the work you're doing. Um, we, Sean and I work in an industry where data is becoming more and more relevant. And uh, my question for you is, 
uh, as you're aggregating some of the data that you've expanded upon uh, going nationwide, is there a bit of information that you're most looking forward to to help sort of take the next step for turn signal? I'm more, most curious about what you're excited for as far as data sets uh, specific to what you're actually gathering right now. Yeah, uh, so turn signal doesn't share any data with any uh, third party organizations, but we do collect it to to better our services. Um, and I think what we do know in a moment's notice, when anyone uses turn signal, we know the name of the person, we know their email address, we know uh, where they were pulled over and how long the pullover lasted. Those are really key data points that we can start collecting. How long are stops in this in this city or this state? Uh, uh, where are the stops happening most often? And as we can aggregate more and more of that data, we can really have robust information. I didn't mention we we have a lot of incredible investors from the Twin Cities, everyone from, from Edward Bergmark, the, the founder of Oxford. Optum Health it was we couldn't have done it without him. Uh, to Groove Capital and to uh, our most recent investor, actually is Stanford. Uh, they have an innovation fund, and we're, we're we're really hoping to partner with them to really take this data and really push it and find out what we can do with it and how we can aggregate it as we get more and more to share it with folks, especially with folks where it could be beneficial on the like legislative side as well. If we could do that. Um, and the, and the last thing I'll say about that is uh, we collect, we ask other information, optional questions that you aren't required to answer, but it would be really robust data to have as well. So in your profile that you can fill out, you can say your race, your age, what color car you have, what type of car you have, and what year car you have, right? When do we find out that 2016 white Tahoes are pulled over more in the state of Minnesota compared to a 2020 Corvette, right? And how can we start aggregating that information as well to find trends that we can, you know, build action plans around? Good morning again. Um, thank you so much. Like, I have so many questions um, that, that are in my head that I'm like, I, I need a private session. Anyways, yeah. um, my question today, though, is, you know, I, I'm a high school principal. Yeah. Um, we have new drivers. Mm. Um, I'm just curious how I understand, like, the parental aspect of it. But is there any focus at all on teens, right, and helping them understand what they need to be thinking? I'm, I'm thinking especially about um, the black and brown students in my school yeah. who live primarily over north. Yeah. Um, how are how what are your thoughts on that or have you has your group thought about how to bring it to youth? Yeah, we, we have a, uh, a wild need for what's well, a cascading effect. Money in the door helps to then help hire more people to do more programs. Uh, so a couple of programs, for instance, we had a donor in the Twin Cities here donate and said, I, I want to cover every membership for the students at Minneapolis North High School. So two years in a row, we went to Minneapolis North and did education around that in the high school. Uh, we went down to Morehouse, a historically black college university, most famous alumni, probably Martin Luther King Jr., uh, we went down there for the last two years as well, providing to those students. We had a partnership with a driving school to provide it to, uh, to A plus driving and, and their drivers as well. All of these, not only to give the education, but to give the memberships as well to really encourage these folks to have it on their phone. But that that is a core part of of the goal is to to reach the youth. It's we think the most important segment, and also because you know like colleges, there's always a new batch coming through. And then you you are setting them up on a trajectory to have it for the rest of their lives, right? And so if we can get them as early as possible, that we really see that as, as beneficial. So it's a concerted effort on our behalf to try to get it to students for sure. Thank you. Uh, Jazz, Russ Michalitz from, uh, I teach entrepreneurism and, and uh, et cetera, various classes, business law, Gustavus. Got it. So um, I, I hear ideas and a student would come in with this idea and I'd say, that's a great idea. Let's do it. And then we'd spend the next 90% of our time trying to figure out how to create the attorney network. So how did you do that? <laughs> it was about 99% of my time trying to create. No. Um, well, first of all, thank you. And I teach entrepreneurial finance at, at St. Thomas. Uh, so um, I, I appreciate the work that you're doing there. It's actually of all of my jobs. It's what I, one of the most exciting to go to every day. So um, the attorney network is the most difficult part about Turn Signal. Anyone can build an app. Uh, even myself, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but my undergrad was in computer science, so I could do it as well. Uh, the attorney network was incredibly difficult because attorneys, more than accountants, more than any other profession, uh, and maybe you could attest to this as well, are incredibly slow at adopting technology and to any change. A lot of uh, uh, a lot of government uh, proceedings for law still use like the three color carbon paper. 
So we had to make a concerted effort of, of finding a way not only to, to get attorneys to agree to it, but to get them to agree to be available 24-7, 365. Um, and so we had to build a network that allowed us, that was so big that if one or two weren't available or possible to answer, the others in that jurisdiction were there. Um, it took three years to get nationwide. Um, and it took a roadshow. We went to conferences, we went to events, we cold called law firms, we put up job postings, we've done everything under the sun to try to find a way to find attorneys. Um, and it was really difficult and something we have to study. And, and, and you, I'm sure you're familiar with the the ever infamous phrase of, of churn. We have to be cognizant of when they want to leave the platform, do we have more to backfill? Um, we, we spend a large majority of our time doing that. And what we, the key that we ultimately found to be best was um, it, it's a, it's like an old sales trick. Uh, we had to go find very quick no's. That was our philosophy. It's like find a no and it's a no is much better than a maybe because we know that we can move on to the next person. And we had to find people who got turn signal, got the premise of turn signal and wanted to be a part of it. Attorneys joined for three reasons. Altruistically, they just want to be there for people in their moment of need uh, as a, a business development opportunity. Maybe I'll get a case from this or their friend of a friend will, will use me as their lawyer. And the third is brand building, right? It's really hard to be a personal injury lawyer or a criminal lawyer and build a brand. And so this is a great opportunity to say I'm a part of something bigger uh, and it is the brand that I embody as a lawyer. And so doing that work and finding those attorneys actively a lot through LinkedIn, unfortunately, is, is how we did it. Hi, um, I, uh, I'm i new um, and uh, I'm in a, a biracial family. My husband and kids are black. Mm -hmm. um, we worried in constantly about their driving and we bribed my son to not drive in high school mm -hmm. um, by telling him he could go to the FIFA uh, <laughs> World Cup, <laughs> which was in South Africa. And we thought, Oh my God, what did we do? But, uh, <laughs> Just push, pushing said, off the problem, Yeah, right. yeah. Could you go to the one in Brazil? Yes. <laughs> um, anyway, he's going to the one he was. Um, our worry was uh, constant, and I was pulled over for driving while black at least three times. Mm. Once for going 56 miles an hour on the freeway. Um, so we were we were plagued. I would say, um, with being pulled over. And, and I just have to commend what you're doing and tell you that for many moms in my situation, this, this is kind of a godsend. Mm. Um, no. So thank you. No, I, I, I appreciate that. And I can, I can really, um, empathize with the sentiment. I've, I've been pulled over 12 times in my life and I'm yet to receive a ticket. Uh, I've never received a ticket. I still have a clean record. And, and even some of those interactions were, uh, 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 less than palatable, um, uh, as I would describe them. In fact, one that I, I tell the story relatively often um, is is I was on my way to the University of St. Thomas to meet with the football coach who would keep me on the bench for most of my career. Uh, he's a good guy. Um, and, and I was pulled over right by uh, when 494 turns into five. Uh, and the officer pulled me over and I was in my dad's white Escalade. And she said, hey, you have a clean record. And, and I see you've never received a ticket. I'm not going to give you one today because you were speeding a little bit. But just know, like, you got to slow down because in this car, you'll get pulled over every time. And when she said that to me, she genuinely, from the bottom of her heart, I could feel it. She was trying to be helpful. She was trying to be helpful. But what she was also telling me, a 17-year-old driving to the college that I wanted to go to, is because of what I look like in the vehicle I was in, I was, I was more likely to get pulled over. And she was telling me that as a police officer. And so that was a kind of eye-opening experience for me to say, oh, okay, this is, this the, the worry that I had in the back of my head was a little bit validated in that moment. And so I can really appreciate what you're, what you're saying from that perspective as well. Thanks for sharing that. Uh Thank you again. Yeah. Interesting to look, very interesting to learn about this. Most of us did not have any awareness. So how does law enforcement feel about this? I mean, can you share uh, anything about, are, are, are they just, how do, yeah. how do they feel about it? Yeah. I, um, when we went out and first started talking to folks, it was really hard to get a meeting. It was really hard to get a meeting. Um, and I can, I've, I've recently, I was on a call with 40 of the leading law enforcement officers in LA County. Um, and, and even in that meeting before it started, I was, I was a little apprehensive and I know my belief is when they walk into that room, they see turn signal as, uh, something that is abrasive or something that is there to make their job harder. What I, what I guarantee and has said in every single call I have with law enforcement is, oh, this was different than what I thought it was. And the analogy we get most often at the end of those conversations is, I really like this. This reminds me of body cameras. I didn't want to wear a body camera when I when I was, I meet with Chief Arredondo a lot. And Chief Arredondo said that uh, when body cams rolled out, 
they were so apprehensive about it. But then the officers started running back into the building to get them if they forgot them because they knew it was a source of truth and it was making their job better at the end of the day, even if it was always watching them. Uh, and that's the analogy we get a lot is this reminds me of body cameras where until I learned what it is or I get the experience, maybe I'd be apprehensive about it. And also to know that we, we always say, as I always say, we're an app to bridge the gap and we're trying to make their lives better as well. But it is a lot of groundwork to inform them of it. I can't go to every police officer and tell them. So we try to do a one to many, we try to go to the associations, we try to go to the chiefs, we try to go to uh, uh, the groups that can disseminate the message as well as possible. I will say that the, the training for the attorney says they have to hang up if an officer asks the attorney to hang up. It is the rule. Uh, we If we're forced off the call, even if it's illegal and unconstitutional, we do. We've never once been forced off a call to date. And um, we're, we're pretty thankful for that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much for this presentation, letting us know about it. And I hope we can all help spread the word. Uh, language. Um, given the fact that Spanish is the second most frequently uh, spoken language and among the third most frequently spoken language here in the Twin Cities, let's say, are you finding language demand for so that the service can be conducted for people who are speak another language as their first language yeah i i on social media and and, and anecdotally in conversations the number one question we get is is language support um it's tough for the lawyers in the room bringing a third party into the conversation can affect confidentiality and other things so we're trepidatious about uh, having interpreters on the phone in live time uh we've looked at building out you know automatic translation and text uh, we've looked at all of those models and definitely we're going to do one of them uh, but unfortunately, it just is a really heavy lift, and there's so many languages. For uh, you, you pointed to the Hmong community here really well. Uh, that's a need in Minnesota, but it's is it as much a need in Wisconsin or or Oklahoma? Uh, and so, what we did do as the stopgap now is we worked really hard to find uh, bilingual attorneys in jurisdictions like Texas and California. More than half our attorneys in in Georgia are bilingual, uh, and so we start with a lot of great attorneys that can be bilingual and help us now until we build in that that later uh, infrastructure to. To, to support other languages. Um, and the other one that people ask about all the time that is right there with it is, is immigration status. Um, if you're driving and you were speeding, or if you're driving and uh, you just stole something from a Best Buy, your worries are here. If you are an immigrant with with uh, that isn't a licensed immigrant and your children live here, your fear is up here. It's wildly different. It's a wildly different legal situation. And so how can we get the information? We thought about having a, a toggle switch, a data point around, um, are you a legal immigrant? But we didn't want to create that fear in our drivers either. So um, another example of the product roadmap that is, is long and 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 uh, work has to be done. Thank you. Thanks again. I appreciate it. Thank you, Jazz. Um, you're doing great work. We will have you sign this book um, and it goes to a third grader. We donate it to Way to Grow and then you get to keep this special rotary pen. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you so much, Jazz. That was really great to hear about what you're doing and how you're going about it and the difference you're making in the world. Thanks for being here. Um, I will at this point say I forgot to uh, make Ross's announcement that he still has British Awards tickets available. Last I knew he had about 60 takers and he still has a few more tickets. That's on December 17th at four o'clock to go with this group. Uh, and people we know to the British Arrow. So if you want a ticket, let Ross know. Um, don't please remember to look at Maria's sheet and give it another few minutes of reflection about who might be interested in coming to one of the events we have coming up. I want to thank our uh, um, Blake for being our greeter. Thank you, Blake. Uh, Lynn for our reflection. Sydney for being our first time day chair. And uh, Dick for being our uh, guest and visitor person. Uh, so I want to uh, welcome again uh, Muhammad and Tim as guests today. So great to have you with us. Come back anytime. We'd love to have you. And Peg for coming back. It's great that you were here today. And Carol, as always, nice to have you. And do you come here next week for a meeting? No, you have a happy Thanksgiving instead. Have a great Rotary Week. See you in two weeks.